usually when IPOs happen in in strong markets like this, um, it reminds me a lot of the uh, late 90s. And, uh, and I was trading a lot then. I was at Goldman as well then. And what you found is after the IPO, it would launch and it would be choppy as hell for a while. Sometimes it would sell off quite sharply. Facebook sold off really sharply as people took profits, repositioned. Now, don't forget, a lot of people have front run this ETF. So they were going to want to unwind. And many of those are going to switch to ETH that I've talked about before. They think, rightly so, that ETH is the most likely candidate for the next ETF. And if Bitcoin went up 100% because of this ETF, ETH will go up 300% because it's less, less liquid, put the same amount of money in. Following this week's historic approval and listing of 10 spot Bitcoin ETFs, excitement has quickly spread to the Ethereum community, suggesting the possibility of an imminent spot Ethereum ETF. However, for those wary of excessive celebration within a single week, Securities and Exchange Commission Chair Gary Gensler has tempered expectations. In a recent CNBC interview, Gensler provided minimal encouragement when questioned about the likelihood of SEC approval for a spot Ethereum ETF in the near future. Gensler has consistently asserted over the years that he views Bitcoin as the only cryptocurrency unequivocally classified as a commodity, placing it outside the SEC's regulatory purview. Despite the absence of official pronouncements regarding Ethereum's security status, the SEC has previously indicated, in legal filings, its jurisdiction over all Ethereum transactions. In a video review of the just-concluded ETF approval and its ensuing events, Raul Pal discusses the potential of an Ethereum ETF. He suggests that an Ethereum ETF could outperform a Bitcoin ETF in the immediate aftermath of this historic week. I've explained it before how I think of this is in two terms. One is anybody who was an investor in Bitcoin in 2011-12 was like a Series A investor. 2013 cycle, maybe Series B. You know, 2015, 16, Series C. The last cycle, Series D. We've just IPO'd it. And usually when IPOs happen in, in strong markets like this, um, it reminds me a lot of the uh, late 90s. And, uh, and I was trading a lot then. I was at Goldman as well then. And what you found is after the IPO, it would launch and it would be choppy as hell for a while. Sometimes it would sell off quite sharply. Facebook sold off really sharply as people took profits, repositioned. Now, don't forget, a lot of people have front run this ETF. So they were going to want to unwind. And many of those are going to switch to ETH that I've talked about before. They think, rightly so, that ETH is the most likely candidate for the next ETF. And if Bitcoin went up 100% because of this ETF, ETH will go up 300% because it's less, less liquid, put the same amount of money in. There's a lot of people unwinding the GBTC arbitrage, closing that position, selling out, moving into a different ETF. There's a lot of shenanigans going on. And you can see that with the net flows. You know, there was four and a half billion or whatever of total flows. Net flows are much smaller, 700 million or so. It's still the biggest ever ETF launches in history as the series. But it's, it's all to play for. And I want you to understand how this works is, okay, all of the pre-orders have now been filled. That was all of these ETF providers going to all of their clients, begging them, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. Everyone's done that. Sure, there'll be some follow-on next week. A lot of the GBTC guys are unwinding, and that will go, you know, some will wait a few days, see if the market is stronger, whatever. So that goes on for a while. You've then taken forward or brought forward a lot of demand. You know, by the end of it, maybe it's a billion, maybe it's two billion of demand you'll have brought forward. So then who's the buyer? You've got the people who front around this who want to sell. So you're going to see volatility. And I've always reminded you guys in the do not fuck it up mantra, part of that is expect 30, 35% pullbacks. Could be less, but just expect them. And that often happens when you get to this kind of 61.8% Fibonacci level in the first leg of the bull run. It often corrects sharply. People get washed out. Leverage is cleared out. And then the real run starts. And the real run is the run to all-time highs and beyond. That usually starts around the halving. So I'm guessing there's maybe a month or two of chop. Uh, and chop in crypto markets is like down 30%. It's just sideways chop. So just be careful out there. I could be wrong. Could keep um, sailing higher. But, uh, you know, it just feels like it's trading a bit heavy. And even if it does as a spurt higher, I don't think it makes much progress yet. Should the SEC categorize Ethereum as a security, 
it would likely adopt an even more adversarial stance towards a spot Ethereum ETF compared to its historical resistance to a Bitcoin ETF, which it had steadfastly rejected for an extended period. The SEC's about-face on the Bitcoin ETF came after being compelled to do so by a federal appeals court, highlighting the potential for a similar court decision to pressure the SEC into approving a spot Ethereum ETF. SEC Chair Gensler acknowledged this shift in circumstances during his recent statement on the approval of the Bitcoin ETF, recognizing that legal judgments have altered the landscape for crypto ETFs. In October, a federal court mandated the SEC to reassess Grayscale's Bitcoin ETF application, contending that the SEC couldn't arbitrarily deny a spot Bitcoin ETF after greenlighting a Bitcoin futures ETF application. Notably, the SEC had already granted approval for an Ethereum futures ETF in the same month, potentially setting the stage for a parallel legal scenario. But really, this is a trade deal between Fiat World and Cryptoland. And it's a trade deal because the capital that's flowing in to Cryptoland is not permanent residency. These are not migrants. If you remember, population growth, uh, GDP growth is population growth plus productivity growth plus debt growth. This is not population growth coming into Cryptoland. That has to be new wallets and actual self-custody or on crypto exchanges and all of that stuff. This is a trade deal to allow TradFi land, our RAA in Cincinnati, to get his clients across into this new world that has higher rates of return. The best example of this I can give you is China entering the WTO. Um, that was a classic example of opening up a market that had much higher rates of return and absorbed huge amounts of capital over time. And I think crypto will absorb huge amounts of capital over time. But remember, these people are tourists. These are, this is not even foreign direct investment, FDI. That would be VC money. What this is, is speculative hot money flows into this new economy. And one day, it will wash out again too. So be careful of that. While we want to encourage them, while it's going to help our ecosystem grow, while it's going to create more capital, more opportunities, it'll move your bag as well. This is not permanent residency in our world. And so, yes, we welcome them with open arms. But remember, what we really want is a new financial system being built. Now, interestingly, you saw um, Larry Fink talking today on CNBC, I think it was. Um, not that I watch CNBC, um, but um, there was a clip. Um, and he was talking about, well, this is just the start, because what we actually want to do is tokenize the entire financial industry. And he's dead right. Firms like BlackRock, Franken Templeton, Fidelity, these are currently, you think of these as fiat world companies that have set up offices in crypto land, much like many businesses like Apple set up in China. But what Larry's talking about is the migration, the eventual migration of the financial system into crypto land, which is which was my core thesis when I first found Bitcoin in 2012 and has remained my thesis of where this is all going amongst many of the other opportunities. So it's really interesting when you think of it in economic terms. These are economies. This is a digital economy of crypto land that has other states within it, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, whatever it may be. So that becomes very interesting. And you can think of, you know, even within that, you've got, you know, interoperable systems, stuff like whether it's Polkadot or Quant or a whole bunch of these things allow or chain link interoperability. That's the travel, the border crossing from going from one of these nation states to another. We've got immigration, which is us opening wallets. We've got FDI, which is VC. We've got trade deals, which is hot money flows chasing opportunities within a country, which is the ETF. Um, we have a monetary system. We have interest rate systems, which is the yields. Uh, we have a collateral system. You can call that Bitcoin. You could even call ETH collateral within the system because it's used within borrowing and lending. We've got asset markets, which is like NFTs. So, and there's a lot more. Um, I've written extensively about this in Global Macro Investor and also in Real Vision Pro Macro. I've talked about this at depth too. This is a new digital economy and it's an emerging market and it's the fastest growing market we've ever seen. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink expressed support for the concept of an Ethereum exchange-traded fund one day after the much-anticipated launch of the Bitcoin ETF. In an interview with CNBC on Friday, Fink noted, I see value in having an Ethereum ETF. These are just stepping stones towards tokenization, and I do believe this is where we're going to be going. Following the SEC's approval, BlackRock's iShares Bitcoin Trust debuted in the U.S., 
contributing approximately $1 billion to the total $4.6 billion trading volume collectively seen by the Bitcoin ETFs. There is speculation that BlackRock, a major asset management firm, may be considering a similar product for Ethereum's native token as part of its ongoing journey toward tokenization. Fink believes that tokenization can effectively address issues related to money laundering and corruption. Additionally, Fink clarified his perspective on cryptocurrency, viewing it not as a currency but as an asset class. He specifically cited Bitcoin as an asset class offering protection against geopolitical risks, highlighting its finite supply compared to gold. Despite the initial excitement over the approval of Bitcoin ETFs, Bitcoin's price experienced a substantial drop, falling below $42,000 on Friday, marking a nearly 10% decline. Fink remains optimistic about the broader vision for the space, emphasizing that more individuals are recognizing it. The price decline occurred a day after the debut of spot Bitcoin exchange-traded funds, representing a significant milestone for the industry. Predictions are open regarding whether Bitcoin will reach $32,000 or if the rally will resume, inviting discussions in the comments section. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.